record. Okay, now we are recording. Um, I'm going to share my screen so I can maybe drop out some things. See if I can pull up the question as well. Sorry, do you mind repeating what you said about the um, Casparian tubes? You said it regulates what goes inside the xylem? Yeah, here is a good picture of that. Um, so this is kind of showing you the cells inside the root and it's showing you the two pathways something could move from the soil into the root and then here's the xylem. Um, and the xylem is like a big tube that transports water and ions throughout the rest of the plant. The idea is if something from out here wants to get to the rest of the plant, it has to get to the xylem and it has to pass through this layer here. So these are the endodermal cells. And in between the endodermal cells, there is the Casparian strip. So you can't really see it but it's like a big barrier right here. And what it does is it says, nothing can just slip through the apoplast or cell wall area here. It totally can down here. That's what you're seeing with this pink route. This is the apoplast or cell wall route, meaning it can completely avoid going inside of cells. But once it reaches here, not possible. There's a big barrier called the Casparian strip. So everything, no matter what it is, if it's water, ions, whatever, at this point, it has to actually go through the endodermal cell membrane. So that acts as a barrier because now you either have to be a small nonpolar molecule that can go directly through the membrane, or you're going to have to have a channel on the membrane. If those two things are not true, then you're not getting to the other side. And so you can't access the xylem, so you can't access the rest of the plant. The idea is if there's a toxin that comes in and it's able to pass through the apoplast, it won't get to the rest of the plant because it'll be blocked at that point there. Okay, thank you. Are we uh, shared these, um, this document? Yes, I shared this um, through Canvas uh, messages. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so the Casparian ship is completely um, impermeable to everything. At that point, it has to go through the cell membrane. So um, like water can go directly through the cell membrane, although most of the time water is going to pass through aquaporin channels. Okay, questions on transpiration. And, yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll just kind of, at this point, go through um, the topics list. And hopefully these questions will be answered as I go through. And if not, as usual, just kind of yell out to me if you have a question relative to what I'm talking about. Um, so there's not a ton of stuff with anatomy. I, I feel like he's not gonna test necessarily directly on anatomy, but in order to understand transpiration or you know how auxin works or what opening and closing the stomata does, you have to know what plant anatomy looks like. Um, he also added like the fact that they are made of, um, that they're developmentally plastic and they're modular. And I think all you'll necessarily need to know with that is plants, uh, their body systems aren't determined at birth. They're very dependent on the environment. So it's possible he maybe gives you a question where he changes the environmental conditions and you might have to predict how uh, the plant anatomy might change. Right, so um, maybe adding more or less leaves depending on 
the availability of sunlight um, or maybe changing the leaf shape or I don't know, something to make their body plan match their environment that they're in. Um, other things with anatomy, you definitely need to know like the leaf airspace and what the stomata are. So this is showing you the cross section of a leaf. Um, the stomata are the little holes that have guard cells on either side. And the guard cells allow carbon dioxide to go in, oxygen to go out, and water to go out. Um, so key things about that that I would know is um, when you're talking about transpiration and you're talking about water movement or water flux, the stomata are the resistance, right? Or the conductance part of the equation. So, right, if I were to like write out, oops, hope my pen works today. If I were to write out flux of water, so just the flux equation is driving force or gradient times conductance. So the driving force or gradient, um, is going to be the water potential of one area compared to the water potential of another area. So that's your gradient. And then the conductance or the resistance is going to be open stomata. So that will tell you uh, the flux of water. Um, so I could definitely see him giving you a question like what's gonna happen if the stomata are closed somehow. And just as a reminder, how that happens is um, when the cells have a a ton of turgor pressure or that internal pressure, they're actually in the open form. And then when they have less pressure, they're actually in the closed form. So stomata get opened and closed by cells regulating solute concentration. So when there is a lot of solutes inside the cell, that causes a lower water potential in the cell so that will cause water to move in so you should be able to talk about that like in terms of water potential and flux so um you could say the water potential inside the cell equals solute potential plus pressure potential. And it just so happens that when solute concentration increases, the solute potential decreases. So as you increase the amount of solutes in the guard cell, you actually cause this solute potential to go down. And by doing so, you decrease the water potential. So why does that matter? Because if you measure the water potential here inside the cell versus outside the cell, and you make this smaller, what you're doing is increasing this gradient or increasing the driving force into the cell. Um, so yeah. Increased turgor pressure is going to cause open stomata. Decreased turgor pressure will cause closed stomata, and that's regulated by regulating the amount of solutes inside the cell. And then the effect of closing the stomata that you should know about is um, CO2 um, concentrations inside the plant will decrease 
O2 concentrations will increase and uh, transpiration will decrease. So what are the effects of each of those three things happening? So if you have decreased CO2 into the plant, that will decrease um, photosynthesis. Um, if you increase oxygen, that's going to increase photorespiration, which is really bad. And decreasing transpiration is going to decrease water movement through the plant and probably end up causing uh, the water potential in the plant to increase. Well, we can talk more about each of those effects when we talk about like photosynthesis and transpiration specifically. Right now I'm just getting you familiar with the anatomy. So yeah, you should know about the stomates, how they can open and close uh, by changing their water potential. Um, and then you should just kind of have this picture in your head for when you're talking about transpiration and leaf air spaces, because I'm gonna kind of reference this area, this leaf air space area, and also these cell walls of the leaf cells. So you should kind of imagine there's always this like film of water on the leaf cell walls that's continuous with the xylem um, so that if you were to look at kind of the xylem through the whole plant, if you start to pull on the water molecules in the leaf cell wall on this water film, you're actually gonna be pulling on the entire water column throughout the entire plant. So kind of imagine water here and imagine it just being continuous with all of the water in the plant. Um, we kind of already talked about the anatomy of the roots, um, symplast versus apoplast. Symplast is when a molecule passes through the membrane into the inner portion of cells. So the inner portion of cells is a symplast and it can travel through the plant by taking those little tubes called plasmodesmata. Um, another possible route to get into the plant is through the apoplast route, which is traveling outside of the plant cells through the plant cell walls. Um, no matter which route you take though, once you get to the Casparian strip, you have to go through the membrane. So that allows us to keep things out. Um, oh yeah, I added this picture just to kind of show what I was trying to get at before. Yeah, question? Um, can you explain how plants are developmentally plastic if buds only turn into phytomers and le not leaves and flowers? Um, yeah, I think they're they're not like absolutely um, plastic to where any cell in the plant can turn into anything, but they're definitely more plastic than animals. Um, so I would say like plant cells are um, pluripotent, not totipotent. Pluripotent being they can give rise to many different types of specialized cells, but maybe not every single type. Um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, this is what I was trying to show. Um, what I was talking about. So here's the leaf airspace. You can see around the leaf cell walls, there's like a film of water. And that film of water is also connected to like the xylem tissue, which is connected to all of the xylem tube throughout the plant. Um, so this was just helpful for me when I was imagining like water here evaporating into the leaf airspace and that evaporative movement of water molecules because there's cohesion that's going to cause some pulling and because it's all connected that's going to pull literally all of the water molecules up that are in this um, water column uh, that are all attached via cohesion okay um so that was it for um anatomy any other questions about 
anatomy before I move on to photosynthesis? Oh, uh, just real quick, like what you just said about the water between cell walls, what were you saying it connects to? Yeah, so this water film kind of on the leaf cell walls, it's connected to the xylem tissue here. And that xylem tissue is connected to like all of the xylem throughout the plant. So xylem that's ending up here is connected to all the way down to like xylem in the roots. So if you have a pull up here, it's gonna pull it all up because they're like holding hands with their little hydrogen bonds. Okay, thank you. Does that relate to how it keeps its structure too? Yeah, definitely. Um, having water going all the way up through those tubes helps like keep the stem up and uh, having water move into uh, the veins and also just the leaf cells keeps the leaves kind of perky. All right. So now we can move on to uh, photosynthesis. So big picture, what is photosynthesis accomplishing? The whole crazy thing that photosynthesis does is it takes this inaccessible carbon right there, that inorganic carbon of CO2, and it incorporates it into an organic form, into this sugar, G3P. That's crazy. Like we cannot do that. We can't take inorganic carbon and use it ourselves. Plants can because of photosynthesis. So that is the thing photosynthesis accomplishes. Imagine grabbing a carbon out of the air and using it for sugar, for energy, for making all the biomolecules they need. Nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, carbs. All of those need carbon and they literally just get it from the air. It's crazy. Um, so in order to do that crazy thing of making CO2 into a sugar, you need to have some kind of energy for those reactions. So the reactions to accomplish that are the Calvin cycle. And in order to do the Calvin cycle, you need energy. That's what the light reactions are for. Um, so plants use energy that is originally from light to basically make a chemical form of energy, which is ATP molecules and NADPH. So we use the light energy, get these nice chemical energies, and then we use those chemical energies to do these reactions, and yay, we get the great thing of making uh, G3P. Sorry, I think my flux is turning on. I'm going to turn it off because it annoys me. Or no, that's just my computer. Okay. Uh, anyways, that's kind of the big picture idea. And the reason I like this diagram is it shows you the dependence of the light reactions on the Calvin cycle, which is kind of backwards. I think a lot of people understand that like, oh, you need the light reactions to make these two things in order to do this. But note that also in order to do the light reactions, you need these molecules back from the Calvin cycle. So that's something that he kind of got at in his practice exam, right? In order to make ATP and NADPH, you need a supply of ADP and inorganic phosphate. You need a supply of NADP plus. Those are products of the Calvin cycle. When the Calvin cycle uses up ATP and NADPH, it makes these two molecules, which then can go back for the light reactions. So even though something that stops the Calvin cycle, maybe it blocks, you have something block Rubisco or something, you would think that doesn't affect the light reactions at all. Well, it kind of does because if you stop doing the Calvin cycle, you stop making these molecules. And even if you have a ton of water and light around to do the light reactions, if you don't have the supplies you need to make ATP and NADPH, you're not gonna be able to do the light reactions. So both are dependent on each other. Okay. So let's kind of take a closer look at the two steps. So first you have the light reactions. And again, the whole goal of the light reactions is to make that molecule, NADPH, and that one, 
which is ATP. Why? Because we can use those chemical energies in the Calvin cycle to get our G3P molecule. So how the light reactions work is you have these big photosystems, which are big protein complexes that have a bunch of pigment molecules in there. And the pigment molecules, remember, those are molecules that have the ability to absorb different wavelengths of light. And depending on the pigment, they might absorb different wavelengths of light. So like he showed you guys this and said, you know, chlorophyll A absorbs what that green line shows, chlorophyll B is the blue line, and then a different pigment called carotenoids is that red line. Um, so it's possible he might ask you like, oh, how would photosynthesis change or how would absorption change if you had this new pigment? And you could give you a new absorption spectrum or take one away. Or maybe he'll ask, um, why is like the overall absorption of a chloroplast or even a leaf different than individual pigments? Um, so I think if he adds or removes a pigment, that's gonna be pretty straightforward, right? If he adds a pigment that can absorb 550 um, nanometers of light, then you'll just say, oh, now this plant can absorb that light and now it can absorb more photons of light and do more photosynthesis. So you should see an increase. And if you remove a pigment, that's gonna remove the number of uh, wavelengths of light the plant can absorb and decrease photosynthesis. Um, and then the reason why the overall absorption of the chloroplast is a lot more broad than individual pigments is because it's um, the chloroplast has all of those different pigments. So it's able to absorb more wavelengths of light. Um, the reason why the full leaf can absorb way more light than individual pigments, like why is it able to absorb 550 nanometer light when the individual pigments seem really bad at that. Um, that has to do with the fact that these um, absorptions are not saying like, uh, like exactly what these pigments can absorb. It's saying the probability that they'll absorb them. So what it's saying is chlorophyll A has an extremely low, but non-zero probability of absorbing 550 nanometer light. But if you have a big leaf and throughout that leaf, there's all these different chloroplasts and in each chloroplast, there's all these different pigments. Um, it's possible that as you go through each of those layers, even though it's a low probability, maybe one out of a thousand chlorophyll A pigments actually absorbs it. So you end up with, because there's so many different chances for that photon to be absorbed as it goes through the leaf, it kind of increases the total probability that it might be absorbed, um, which is why you see that. Um, so that's just a kind of a background on pigments. And they're all kind of um, existing in these photosystems. Um, so these photosystems are um, responsible for first absorbing the uh, light energy coming from sunlight or whatever. And then those chlorophyll pigments, when they absorb that light energy, they get their electrons excited to a higher energy state. And one special pair actually uh, does a redox reaction and it donates electrons up to a different molecule that then donates electrons to another protein that donates and donates, and all these electrons get passed protein to protein. Yeah, question. Do we have to remember the name of like specific proteins like cytochrome and like which comes in which order or would he provide a diagram? No, I'm sure he would provide a diagram like he did on the uh, practice exam. Okay. Yeah, so you have light come in, then you have basically these molecules playing hot potato with an electron. And as the electron gets passed, uh, these middle molecules are going to use some of that energy from the electrons to pump in hydrogens. Um, 
this pair of chlorophyll over here that is the first one to kind of donate electrons actually loses electrons and it has to get its electrons back somehow if we want this chain to continue. So the way this special pair of electrons gets its electron replenished is from water. So when water split, it donates electrons back up here and therefore kind of supplying the first uh, electron in this electron transport chain. So you have hydrogens coming in from these middle guys using the electrons, and then you have more hydrogens being produced when water donates its electrons to the start of the chain when it's split into oxygen, gas, and hydrogens. So what you end up getting is this really high concentration of hydrogens inside the thylakoid. Um, and that gets used by ATP synthase, which is a protein that uses the movement of protons high to low to create ATP. So that's the whole process of how the light reactions make ATP. You absorb light, you move electrons down a chain, you split water to repl replenish the electrons, and then you use all of that um, hydrogen buildup inside the thylakoid to pump and power ATP synthase. Um, and then the other thing we need to do is now make NADPH. So NADPH is made kind of in a similar way, but maybe less complicated because it doesn't rely on the hydrogen concentrations really at all. All it does is light comes into photosystem one, the chlorophyll gets excited, one special pair passes electrons to a molecule, then passes it to another molecule, then passes it to another molecule. And then that molecule is going to use the energy of electrons to uh, make NADP plus NADPH. So this is just a enzyme that catalyzes that reaction. Yes, question. Um, is NADP plus reductase the final electron acceptor or is it some something else? It is, um, but it's also going to use those electrons and give them to NADPH. So I guess technically okay. I would say that molecule, NADPH is the final except. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, pass electrons, make NADPH. You didn't really need the hydrogen stuff at all. Um, and then just as a little detail, uh, the special pair also need to get its electrons back. But instead of getting it from water, like the photosystem two did, it just gets it from um, this molecule over here, uh, back from the first chain. So that kind of connects this whole thing together. Electrons go here to here to here, here, here. And then it actually jumps over here and replenishes the electrons that way we don't actually need water the way we did over here. Um, so yeah, I could see him, you know, breaking different parts of this pathway and then maybe saying like what might be affected, you know, so if you break anything here or here, that's going to affect uh, the hydrogen gradient and therefore the making of ATP. Um, however, if you break anything here, it's also going to affect the ability to pass electrons over here, and therefore it'll also affect the making of NADPH. Um, but on the other hand, if you break something with like photosystem one or anything over here, this shouldn't really affect ATP directly. Similarly, if you if he does something to change the hydrogen concentration, that's like a common question I've seen asked in the past. Like they'll say, "Oh, we added a, um, I don't know, a pump for hydrogen in the in the thylakoid membrane that pumps hydrogens out of the thylakoid. What's going to be affected? That shouldn't directly affect NADPH." because it just doesn't rely on anything with hydrogen. But if you mess with the concentration of hydrogen, that will definitely mess with ATP synthase, which is directly using those hydrogens to make ATP. So anything that he could do to mess with having high 
hydrogens in and low hydrogens out, that's going to be something that affects ATP, but not necessarily NADPH. Yeah, question. Um, so what if she, like, what if photosystem one was broken? Would this make um, this cycle, like, cyclic? Um, like, would the electrons still be able to go to ferrodoxin and then, like, would we still be able to make NADPH? Or like the whole system is broken after that? I think that if you broke photosystem one, you would not be able to make an ADPH. But like would the electrons like move back to like um to plastic curing and like would we still be able to make ATP? Like would it become cyclic? There there is such thing as um cyclic electron flow, but it does rely on photo system one and like we specifically did not teach that like I know for a fact he's not going to talk or expect you to know about cyclic transfer I can't say that okay thank you you're welcome another question hey, um sorry hi can you hear me yeah I can you great awesome um from the the most latest uh p practice exam there was a question on the mechanism of this where there were certain enzymes that would break um, either like they would decrease the concentration of NADPH or ATP or like O2 or something like that. And for one of those questions, I'm not sure if you can pull that up or not, but for one of those questions, I think it was part B, it just talked about how um, an enzyme just reduced the concentration of NADPH, but in the answer key, it mentioned how it has to break photosystem one wouldn't it just be photosystem two that's broken though? Like out of, I'm unsure how, um, like for like how that works. If you could explain that question. Yes, it it was a question. Was it on the practice exam? Yeah, practice exam four, question one, part B. Let's look. I should have just pulled the practice exam up. Mm-hmm. My computer is very slow. Usually when I'm on Zoom specifically. Okay. Oh yeah, I think there might have been a actual um like typo in the answer key. Because I think this is the one that's okay. What can the we answer key? The answer key said the answer was four, but shouldn't it be three? Mm, let's see. Okay. So for Part B. What chemicals might completely stop the function of only photosystem one? If you only stop one, this is saying you would see a decrease in oxygen, NADPH, and ATP. Yeah. I don't... <laughs> I don't think that's right. I think this is not. Correct, yeah. So he said for A, but yeah, I, I just don't understand how he's saying if you impact photosystem two and photosystem one, you're gonna have the exact same effects, especially because O2 production is happening just over here at photosystem two. So mm -hmm. There's absolutely no way that would be affected by um, stopping or messing with photosystem one. Like I can say that very confidently. So I can say confidently, this is a mistake I'm guessing on the key. And if he puts this on the exam, I will fight him <laughs> and say that's just wrong. So yeah. Thank you.
You that makes sense. So it's three, right? So for B, the correct answer is three. Yes. Well, um, actually, I asked this question in Piazza, and Professor explained that like because uh PSI, I think it's because PSI like donates electrons to the final electron acceptor. So if PSI doesn't work, then the ETC would be jammed. So then the whole whole thing wouldn't work. So then you would see like like over time a decrease in O2 and ADPH and ATP. That's how he explained it. I think that's wrong personally, but I'll I'll actually bring this up to him. Yeah, because I feel like uh, if you mess up PS1, these other proteins here, they will still accept electrons. I mean, it's just like, as long as you have a more electronegative molecule. I guess, okay. So he's maybe saying that it'll just, they'll just stop here. Yeah, like like the electrons, they would like, like kind of jam the system, if you will. Uh, we, yeah, this is also a concept introduced in bio 200. Like, like you had cyanide, for example, it blocks the final electron acceptor. So then like, the electrons they can't move because like they're building up in the I system. I see. So like now this one's not gonna want to accept electrons. Yeah, that's. I think that's what on. he said. And then, okay. Okay, then maybe I'm wrong. Um. So yeah, I I can I can maybe see that being true, if you stop. Um, allowing a molecule to take electrons from this guy, then he's just going to hold on to it and I'll stop everything here. And so then but it, the question is asking which would completely stop only photosystem one, not just so based on that explanation, it means that that fun the molecule will stop both photosystem one and photosystem two. But the question is asking for, for the one that would only stop photosystem one, not photosystem. So it for shouldn't work idly. Because it stops both of them instead of just the one. Um, I think this question is kind of poorly worded, in my opinion. Like when I was doing it, it I I saw that that um it says only stop the function for this specific system, and I That's didn't exactly. do any of the chemicals because like if you stopped the function of PS. Yeah two or ps1 then the entire chain would essentially stop so like you can't only affect one of the systems without affecting the rest yeah i agree with that because <laughs> it says only photosystem one but then like that whole explanation relies on the fact that photosystem two is going to stop yeah Which is why, ideally, for the exam, we would be able to like um, edit it. But <gasps> hopefully, it'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> but oh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, could we go over the other parts of the problem? Uh, the other parts of this problem? Yeah, I was a little bit lost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just so for for question one specifically. Okay, so for A, which one would only stop photosystem two? If you stop photosystem two, you would expect um, O2 to be affected, um, ATP to decrease. And if you're not sending electrons, here, then eventually this isn't going to get its electrons replaced, I mean, by that logic, and then you would also not be able to do NADPH production. So if you stop photosystem two, you're going to shut down this entire pathway. Um, so you should see a decrease in O2, NADPH, and ATP. So that's what A is getting at. B, we kind of just talked about. 
where again, if you affect photosystem one, you definitely affect NADPH. And then he's saying you've also ended the movement of electrons by making them stop here because there's nowhere for them to go anymore. So that should affect everything here. And then you won't have water splitting. You won't have um, ATP production. So again, everything's going to be messed up. Okay, which chemical might completely stop um, the function of only rubisco? Um, so if it's only rubisco, it's nothing to do with these light reactions. It's something to do with the Calvin cycle. So we should be able to still make ATP, uh, make NADPH, and produce oxygen. All of those should be fine if we mess up this enzyme here in the Calvin cycle. Um, so I'd expect this to be fine, this to be fine, this to be fine. So which one is saying no oh, change? I have a question for that part. Um, if there was an option where it said only a decrease in oxygen, would that count because of photorespiration, how oxygen contributes to rubisco? Well, if rubisco is not working, photorespiration won't happen either. Oh, okay. So then you can see on his answer key, he said number two, because the light reaction should be fine. And then he did a little dotted line around four. And that's kind of getting at that idea that the Calvin cycle is affecting the light reactions indirectly because it's making ADP and NADP plus as byproducts that then go and are used in the light reactions as reactants to actually make ATP and to make an ADPH. So like initially you would expect all of these things to not be affected by Rubisco, but then over time, if you stop supplying ADP and um, NADP plus, you'll actually get all of those things being affected, which is why he did that light for. If CO2 was an option, decrease in CO2, would that work for the Rubisco? Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, I see some raised hands. Is it about something I've said here? Uh, no, it's about something else. I had a question about uh, the water potential of air. So in the first uh, transpiration lecture, it shows a graph of as humidity decreases, the water potential of air uh, decreases down to like minus 300. And I was wondering, is the water potential of relative humidity positive or negative? What contributes to the water potential of air? Water potential of air is just dependent on relative humidity. And as relative humidity goes up, the water potential goes up. As relative humidity goes down, the water potential goes down. Okay. And then uh, for the equation of relative humidity, it shows uh, water vapor in the air divided by the max amount of water that the air can hold. Yeah, And I was wondering if the max amount of water that the air can hold will go up, you'll get a smaller number closer to zero, but relative humidity goes down because the water air can hold more water. Yeah, it goes down because the, total, the denominator is getting bigger. But if the denominator is getting bigger, wouldn't your final value be closer to zero, not further away from zero? Um, it'll be smaller. Yeah, smaller. Like if you have one over, uh, like 10 over two, and then it turns into 10 over four, it changes from five to 2.5. That's not getting bigger, more negative numbers. That's getting closer to zero. Um, I guess if it's a negative number, then that's but, true. But negative 10 <laughs> over two, negative 10 over four. It's still negative 2.5. Um, I don't know exactly. I would just know that relative humidity goes down as temperature goes up. Okay, so just don't worry too much about the math of the equation. Just learn the logic and follow along with that. Yes, yeah. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
can you explain that whole like logic behind relative humidity going down and like that affecting transpiration rate of a plant? Um, and not affecting transpiration. Oh, in affecting transpiration. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Um, I was. I'll get to transpiration. I was. I. I just want to finish up photosynthesis. Thank you. So um, I have a question on so like for C since he like did daughter on on like number four. If we were to choose four, like would that be right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, in that case, he would accept either. Question. Yeah, so um, I'm confused. Like, why wouldn't chemical one or three um, impact the function of rubisco? Because de decreasing NADPH and ATP would mean less energy for uh, uh, the synthesis part of photosynthesis so like well i think it's just like the fact that like chemical one is um decreasing atb but not o2 and nadph so uh if you're saying if it was affecting rubisco the only way it would decrease atp is if it's because it's not supplying enough ADP, and then you would expect also it's not supplying enough NADP plus. So it'd be weird to get a decrease in ATP, but no change in NADPH. So I think okay. why. I think I get it. So essentially that um, if the function of rubisco was halted, you wouldn't be getting, um, you'd be getting a decrease in O2, NADPH, and ATP. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. And then um, D, that one should be pretty straightforward if you just impact ATP synthase. Um, that's not going to affect anything but the production of ATP. Um, and then what chemicals uh, definitely decrease G3P production? Um, so if you decrease ATP, that's needed for the Calvin cycle. So you shouldn't make G3P. If chemical one, I mean, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't cause any change. So I guess that one's fine. Um, if you decrease NADPH, you need that for G3P production. And if you decrease all of them, you need ATP and NADPH for the Calvin cycle to make G3P. So, um, <laughs> a little comment. Yeah. Why so does decreasing, why does decreasing O2 like, um, interfere with the production of G3P? Um, I mean, none of these are just decreasing oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. The only one that is decreasing oxygen is also decreasing these other two things. And it would be hard to imagine something that is affecting the splitting of water, but not affecting the making of ATP and NADPH. So I, I don't see it possible for there to be one that isolates just blocking the splitting of water. Okay, and also like a follow-up question on that. So like, what if the carb, like CO2 levels were low? So like, would it like, so then it would, it will use oxygen instead, right? Yeah, yes. Yep. And that would just waste energy, but not do anything else yeah yep okay so yeah just to kind of finish out photosynthesis all of these things happen to make those two chemicals that then go to the calvin cycle to make g3p and then um he definitely wants y'all to know about 
Rubisco, which is the enzyme that binds to CO2 and then converts it into this first little sugar form. And what you should know about Rubisco is that it's super slow and inefficient as an enzyme. So slow in that the number of reactions it performs per second is really low. And then um, inefficient in that instead of being like most enzymes that will only bind to the perfect substrate, perfect molecule, it basically binds with oxygen too, when it's really ideally only supposed to bind to CO2. And so if it's binding to oxygen instead, it won't actually go through with the Kelvin cycle, it'll go through with photorespiration. And that's really bad because if Rubisco binds oxygen, instead of making G3P, it does these series of reactions known as photorespiration that produces CO2 and uses up ATP. So we're using up energy and we're literally defixing carbon. We're trying to grab carbon and we're doing the exact opposite. So that's why it's such a bad thing. So yeah, if you close stomates, what you're doing is increasing the likelihood that Rubisco is gonna bind to oxygen because you blocked CO2 from getting in. You've also blocked oxygen from getting out. And so what you'll get is an increase of this horrible, terrible pathway that we hate. Yeah, question? Could you, could you also say that the cycle is self-regulating? Uh, where if you're making, like, if you're doing more of the photo path, then you get all the extra stuff like O2 and ATP. And so um, Rubisco would bind more to O2 and then use up the ADP to make sure there's no extra. Is that is that fair to assume or no? You're saying, will the products of photorespiration then be used to go back and do the Calvin cycle? No, I'm trying to say that like if the photo part of the photo, like the electron transport chain is more prevalent than the Calvin cycle for some reason, is it possible or fair to assume that Rubisco acts as a negative feedback loop enhancer and brings it back to homo homeostasis because it uses the products of uh, the electron transport chain? Um, I, I could say that's a, that's a fair hypothesis about why maybe Rubisco has stayed so terrible for so long. Um, but it wouldn't decrease the NADPH levels. So I don't know, because if you do the light reactions too much and you have too much ATP and NADPH, the big problem is the NADPH toxicity, not so much the ATP, but maybe. Another question, what? Um, so if you decreased transpiration, would photosynthesis also decrease? I mean, since a photosynthesis uses water or is it just that there's enough water in the system so that when transpiration stops, it's not necessarily an issue? That's a great question. I'm glad that you asked it because I think it could possibly be very important. Yeah, I would say, so if you stop transpiration, um, that in itself, I don't think would directly affect photosynthesis because water is not the rate limiting step of photosynthesis. All the cells in the plant, their, their cytoplasm is full of water. So transpiration, if it stops for a bit, unless like, the cells become empty, in which case nothing will work. They're always going to have water available. So what I could see is like, maybe he asks, okay, the stomates, sorry, the stomata close. Why is that going to cause photosynthesis to go down? And your answer should be because CO2 can't get in, not because transpiration or water movement has stopped. And that is something that in one of our meetings, he like, he made a big deal about, and he, he seemed very excited about people knowing that because people 
kind of naturally think if you close the stomata, that affects transpiration and that's going to affect photosynthesis. And he's like, no, 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 it's actually the lack of carbon dioxide that's the problem with closing the stomates for photosynthesis. So I, I could see that being a question he asks. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Okay, I, I just made some other notes. Um, I, okay, photo, gross photosynthesis versus net photosynthesis. Um, so gross photosynthesis is all of the carbon dioxide that's used up by the plant in photosynthesis. And uh, net photosynthesis is all of the carbon dioxide that's used up uh, minus the contribution of the carbon dioxide being produced by cellular respiration. So I think this is one of the cases where adding numbers actually makes it more clear. So like imagine you have a plant and a bottle and you measure the CO2 levels of that plant. And in the dark, you measure a rate of negative three CO2. So remember in the dark, you're turning off photosynthesis. So that's giving you your cellular respiration rate. So your cellular respiration rate is negative three, which is the amount of CO2 lost by the plant. Um, in the light, you measure a rate of plus 12. So that's giving you your net photosynthesis, right? Because in the light, there should be both cellular respiration and photosynthesis happening. So your net photosynthesis rate is plus 12. Now, if you wanna get your gross photosynthesis rate, you know that you have to take into account what amount of CO2 consumed by photosynthesis is being kind of hidden in your net by cellular respiration. So you just kind of add on whatever the cellular respiration rate is and you get your gross amount. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, question? Why is the cellular respiration rate minus three? Um, it, it's just by convention, I just chose one way. You could also represent it as positive three and then the photosynthesis as negative. It's just by convention, we usually uh, talk about the cellular respiration as being the negative um, and the photosynthesis as the positive. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so that brings us to this net photosynthesis graph, which I could see him possibly putting on the exam. Um, so what you should know is when the, so this is showing you as you increase light intensity, how's the net photosynthesis changing? So when light intensity is at zero, net photosynthesis is negative, and that tells you the amount of carbon dioxide change happening because of um, cellular respiration. And then as you increase the light intensity, at some point, the amount of carbon dioxide produced and consumed by cellular respiration and photosynthesis equate to each other. And that's known as the compensation point. And that's when this curve hits zero. There's no CO2 being net produced or lost. Um, and then as you increase the light intensity even more, now that's when the amount of CO2 consumed by photosynthesis is overcoming um, whatever is being done by cellular respiration. And it will increase until it eventually plateaus. Um, so as you increase the light intensity, eventually you'll have so many photons of light hitting the pigments that they're going to be at their max absorption rate. And even if you keep increasing the number of photons, the Photosynthesis rate won't increase because the pigments are all saturated. Yeah, questions? Um, 
this might be a really stupid question but um like cellular respiration happens in in animals right in mitochondria yeah why are we combining plant with that yeah that's a a common misconception is like animals do cellular respiration and plants do photosynthesis um, when in reality uh, plants do cellular respiration too just like animals so the point of cellular respiration is to make ATP molecules. So just like animals need to make ATP, plants need to make them too. So plants have mitochondria, they're doing uh, cellular respiration too. So like plant can do, plant can use CO2 or oxygen to make glucose basically. Um, so because cellular respiration would use oxygen, right? Yeah, cellular respiration uses oxygen to convert glucose into ATP. Photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide to make G3P, which can be made to make glucose, which then could be used to make ATP. But photosynthesis doesn't directly make ATP, right? It makes G3P, mm -hmm. which then can be used in cellular respiration to make ATP. I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I had a question about another one of the lectures. In okay. the plant nutrient lecture, uh, there's a question about how plants respond to increased atmospheric CO2. And when CO2 in the atmosphere increases, the plants close their stomata more because they don't need CO2 because they already have enough. Or at least that's the hypothesis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if there's a threshold for that, because I would have thought that if a, a plant's photosynthesis is limited by CO2 and you introduce more CO2, you'll just get more photosynthesis. And that's it. Yeah, yeah. So is this question assuming that we've passed the threshold where plants are at maximum photosynthesis and they don't need more CO2 and that CO2 is no longer a limiting factor? Yeah, and I'll say like that's just a hypothesis. We That's a pretty new area and we're not totally sure exactly okay. how, how that works or if there's a threshold or what the signaling pathway is we don't know i i think the point that he brought up this example was to um, explain how if they close their stomata they can use less water and so the idea was that they would use less water as a plant but because they're transpiring less they would get less nutrients into their system yeah yeah I was mainly just confused because I would have thought that if CO2 is the main limiting factor and you add more CO2, then you just get more photosynthesis. Yeah, you would have to assume that it's it's working at its max or Rubisco is working at its max rate. Yeah. yeah. All right, that's all. Does the improper... Um, conversion of oxygen in by Rubisco that produces CO2 contribute to the net photosynthesis or is that too small of a magnitude to have an impact? It definitely does. Yeah. Um, and that's a good question that he could ask is like, how, how would this graph change if you changed the um, efficiency of Rubisco? Um, and what you would see is first of all the um, the plateau of the graph should increase because the total amount of photosynthesis that's done when the light reactions are at max should be more. And I think that would also end up being shown at each point along the graph because say at this light intensity here, um, if you have just a better Rubisco, you're going to be fixing carbon better. So every point along the graph, not just at the plateau, should become higher. So I would draw a line that was like, same cellular respiration point, but increase all along the curve. Um, so that's been like a popular exam question in the past, which I kind of get at here is like, if you get if you're given all these different scenarios, can you draw a new curve for what might happen? So some of the things we've done in the past is say, what would happen to the graph with increased metabolism? 
So you should know metabolism is cellular respiration. So increased metabolism would mean more cellular respiration. So you would draw um, a deeper um, negative or the y-intercept should go down. And then it should increase with the same rate and end up plateauing at the same spot. Um, what would happen to if you do something to mess up the light reactions? So I don't know, you like mess up ATP synthase or something, or you um, provide less light or you decrease the amount of pigments. Um, if you change something with the light reactions, um, then you should expect the slope of the graph to decrease, right? Um, so the slope of this graph is showing you the light dependency of photosynthesis. So if you change anything with the light reactions, um, that slope should change to either become lower or higher, depending on if you increase or decrease the light reactions. Um, if you make changes to uh, the Kelvin cycle, kind of like a more efficient Rubisco, like someone just said, then it's going to increase faster. So that's kind of showing you like, it's gonna just have higher points along the entire graph and then also plateau at a higher level. Um, so yeah, that's something I could definitely see him asking about. Um, any other questions about the graph? Okay. Yeah, question. Sorry, I think I kind of missed it. So you say if we make Rubisco more efficient, then the graph should be more steeper? Yes, um, just because each point along the line mm -hmm. is going to be higher. So maybe not necessarily like uh, changing the slope, but each point will be higher. Okay, so, so it's not st steeper? Yeah, just higher okay. along. So the same shape, but just higher. Mm -hmm. And then okay, and like... if you're changing light reaction stuff, because the slope is a light dependency thing, right? So like what would we have to change in light reaction to make it more steep? Let me just draw it. Oops. Ah. Okay. So if this normal graph. I'd say if you change the light reactions, you can do something like this versus something like this, where you want to try to keep the same slope if you're just changing Kelvin cycle things, and you want to try to draw like a steeper slope if you're changing light reaction things. Yeah, I, I get that. But I guess my question was like, what specifically in the light reaction would we change to like make it more steeper? Oh, like if you, I don't know, gave the, supplied the plant with double the amount of chlorophyll pigments, or you made a mutation that caused the proteins of the electron transport chain to be more efficient at pumping in hydrogen, mm -hmm. something like that. something to make the light reactions happen better. Okay, and and like if the Rubisco is more efficient, right? Would it make like more products, or it, it's just going to make it faster, right? Yeah, it's just going to overall at each light intensity point, the amount of photosynthesis should be greater. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Wait, so then why would it plateau sooner? Just because, no, wait, yeah, why would it do that? Plateau sooner? 
that's what you said. I, I think that if the Rubisco efficiency was increased, it would plateau sooner, the slope. No, I would just say it would plateau at a higher point. Um, I would say it would plateau sooner if it was something with the light reactions because you're changing the slope of the line. So the reason, sorry, I'm still a bit confused. So why would it, what would you do to make it plateau sooner? Um, I think just anything that makes the slope of the line jump up quicker, even if it like, it's much more efficient at using light, which is what's being shown by this jumping up quicker. It's saying, even with just a tiny bit of light, we're doing a ton of photosynthesis. Uh, eventually it's going to max out because all of the pigment molecules are saturated. And even if you increased the efficiency of the light reactions, there's some maximum point. So okay. the slope of the line is depend is light is saying, I'm better with light. And how does that happen? through the light reactions, changing things with the light reactions. Okay, but uh, changing the efficiency of Rubisco wouldn't change when it plateaus, it would just yeah. Yeah. change like how high the points are? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, another question? So like in the absence of light, would it just keep doing cellular respiration? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, excuse me. You said they plateau at the same point. It just plateaus sooner, but they plateau at the same level? No. Um, or it plateaus higher? If it has more chlorophyll? It should plateau higher. Higher and sooner, right? Higher and sooner if it's something with the light reactions. I would say just higher if it's something with the Calvin cycle. Although, okay. I mean, you could also, you know, argue like what he's made a big deal about is that the Calvin cycle is providing the ADP and NADP plus to the light reaction. So even if you increase the efficiency of the common cycle, then you're gonna go and ideally increase the efficiency of the light reaction. So then maybe the slope would be affected. <laughs> I'm convincing myself out of that too. So if you increase the Calvin cycle, I, I, I think you could technically draw it as increasing the slope as well because of that dependency of the light reactions on the Calvin cycle. But kind of like how he answered the other one where both answers were true. I think you Okay, have so so more chlorophyll or more efficient chlorophyll would be an example of a light reaction, whereas um, for the Calvin cycle, he could talk about like Rubisco or G3P or something. Yeah. Okay. Like literally. Okay. Um, an exam question in the past was like, what would happen if you doubled the amount of Calvin cycle enzymes? Okay, thank you. And I will say for that, um, I, again, this is just last year. I don't know if it has anything to do with what y'all will be tested on, but it was important that you did draw the plateau at exactly double whatever this number was. And people got salty about that. Like if this was 20, you need to draw the plateau at 40 if you double the amount of enzymes, um, which I don't even know if it would double in that way, but I don't know. Just do it <laughs> if you get that question. Wait, can you label the the upper graph? Yeah, so I mean, the x-axis is light intensity and the y-axis is net photosynthesis. No, I mean like the the, the graph, the lines. Oh, these lines? Yeah. Um, I would say this was my original line. Uh, this was my something with the Calvin cycle line. 
And then these are my light um, dependent reaction change lines. And then I said these would also qualify as Calvin cycle changes if you make the argument that the Calvin cycle supplies a DP and NADP plus the light reactions, then if you increase the Calvin cycle, you should also increase the light reactions. Then you get the increase in the slope as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, any more questions about photosynthesis? Again, um, big things I can see is like closing stomata, how is that going to affect photosynthesis? You should know it's gonna affect CO2. You should know it's gonna affect Rubisco doing more photorespiration and why. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, hold on. Sorry, hold on. Um, so do you think he's going to ask us about like the actual equation because I think in lecture 29 he like had us go through this whole like this is like the chemical equation to get like CO2 out of the atmosphere and then this is photosynthesis like do you think it's reasonable to assume he would test us on that at all like giving us the equation or whatnot or just focusing more on the concepts surrounding photosynthesis? I think the concepts surrounding photosynthesis and knowing what's going on, where, and how it affects things. So like, I think the big reason why he showed that was to, you know, emphasize like, even though we put this all together, the oxygen and water portions and the light reactions and like the CO2 conversions happening in the Calvin cycle. So more conceptual than, yeah, having you like go through or do any kind of thing with the equation specifically. All right, um, so the next big topic is um, plants and water within cells and then uh, plants and water in transpiration. So when we first talked about, I guess, water potentials, we are just considering water moving in and out. Um, of a individual cell uh, because we are talking about um, that being part of the mechanism for causing cell expansion or plant cell elongation. And then we moved on to say, okay, that's how water moves across the cell, um, but it's also going to influence how water moves through an entire plant, and that's transpiration. So we can start by kind of talking about water movement within the cell and the specific case of like elongation. Um, so what you should know is that for live plant cells, um, water potential is just determined by primarily solute potential and pressure potential. Solute potential reflects the amount of solutes inside the cell such that as you increase solutes or you increase solute concentration, that actually causes a decrease in solute potential. So they're inverse. Um, and then the pressure potential of a cell that just reflects turgor pressure. So both of those can affect the water potential and then the water potential is overall going to tell you um, the direction of water movement. Because again, if you go back to like the flux equation, water potential is that gradient, right? So the water potential difference between the inside and the outside of the cell, that's your gradient, that's your driving force. Um, and then you times it by conductance, 
which is just the number of holes in the membrane that allow water to pass. And that's not really that relevant because um, usually there's lots of aquaporins around. And even if there's not, there's gonna be a non-zero conductance for water because water is small enough to move directly through the membrane without any channels. So even if you get a problem where he's like, I blocked all the aquaporin channels, will there be any flux of water? Your answer should be, um, actually, yes. As long as there's a gradient, water will move because it can go directly through the membrane. Um, so there's no way to make water conductance across a membrane zero. So the only way you could get like no net flux of water across the membrane is if you made the gradient zero. So if you made the water potential inside and outside of the cell equal to zero. Um, so what does this have to do with cell elongation or how um, plant cells actually grow and become uh, bigger? So I, I can take you guys through kind of exactly how all of that happens and kind of relate it to um, the case of auxin, just because that was an example we talked about in class and maybe it will come up or not. I don't know. Uh, but let's talk about, yeah, how do cells elongate um, in response to auxin that has been uh, produced in the case of like maybe trying to make the plant grow towards light. Let's say we have a stem. And the stem has all these different plant cells. And just kind of randomly dispersed, you have these little pin proteins. So the pin proteins are um, transporters of auxin. So like if auxin comes into this cell, it's gonna leave through this pin protein wherever the pin protein is. So if they're kind of randomly distributed, auxin's not gonna accumulate in any one spot. It'll just kind of bounce around depending on where the pin proteins are. But what happens is if you have a uh, blue light coming from one side, that blue light is sensed by uh, phototropin and phototropin uh, creates a signaling cascade in all of these cells that says move every pin protein to the opposite side of the light. So all of these cells are gonna move their pin proteins to the left side. It's kind of hard to draw, but each of these cells have their pin proteins moved to the left side. So then when auxin travels through the plant, so auxin is made at the tips of shoots and moves down. And then where it ends up is dependent on where the pin proteins are. So if auxin's coming through, then it's going to start to be biased towards the left side because it's gonna go into a plant cell and the only way it can exit is through that left side. So you get a bunch of auxin all on the side opposite of the light. And so then if we zoom in on these cells on the left side, we'll see that auxin is going to create a signaling pathway to cause these cells to elongate, whereas these ones on the right won't. And that will actually cause the stem to bend towards the light because these left cells have gotten really big, whereas these right side cells have stayed small. And that change in size causes the bending. Um, so now let's look at, you know, how is auxin causing elongation in one cell? So there's kind of three things you need for a plant cell to elongate. Um, you need the cell wall to break up. 
you need water to go in. And three, you need the cell pressure potential to be greater than the yield threshold. If all these things are true, the cell will elongate. Um, so how does that happen? So auxin is going to enter a cell and it's going to cause a signaling cascade that makes these um, hydrogen pumps stay active or become more active. So you should just think more auxin, increased hydrogen pump activity. And hydrogen is pumped from inside to the cell wall. And that's why it's called acid growth hypothesis, because you're causing the cell wall to become more acidic by putting a bunch of hydrogen in the cell wall. Um, so when you put hydrogen in the cell wall, that activates um, expansin proteins in the cell wall. And expansin proteins basically break up the bonds in the molecules making up the cell wall. So that's how we get number one to happen. The cell wall is gonna just kind of break up when protons go into the cell wall because of those expansins. So that's step one. And then we need water to go in. And that's also kind of caused by the hydrogen pump activity. So by pumping all these hydrogens out, we've created a, a huge, um, oops, a huge gradient for um, hydrogen. So it's really high hydrogen in the cell wall and really low hydrogen inside the cell. So the ECG, the electrochemical gradient of hydrogen is pointed inward. So we have some sim porters that utilize the movement of hydrogen down its concentration gradient through the channel to move chloride molecules against its concentration gradient into the cell. So we increase chloride and that's increasing the solute concentration. Um, at the same time, when you pump all this hydrogen, this positively charged hydrogen out, you make the cell membrane potential or the electrical gradient super negative, like 130 millivolts. And if you remember the equilibrium potential for potassium is like negative 80, typically. It might be a little bit different for plants, um, but it's around there. Um, and so by pumping out hydrogens, you made the membrane potential super negative. And by doing so, you made potassium's ECG pointed inward as well. So there are potassium channels. And because the electrochemical gradient for potassium is inward, because remember, ions always want to get to their equilibrium potential. And right now, this uh, membrane potential is more negative then potassium wants it to be, wants it to be at negative 80. So potassium, which is positively charged, can move inward to try to get the membrane potential back to negative 80. So that's gonna cause potassium to go into the cell. And then you have both chloride and potassium increasing inside the cell, and that's gonna cause the solute concentration, oops, to go up which should um, cause the solute potential to go down. And if the solute potential goes down, the water potential goes down. 
So if we have the water potential inside the cell decreasing, then we're increasing the likelihood that water wants to travel inside because water likes to go from high to low water potential. So if you, again, start talking about anything with water potential, if you get a problem like this, you wanna use the words gradient and driving force when you're talking about why water is moving because of water potential. You increase the gradient or you've increased the driving force or you de decrease those things. So you want to change the solute concentration inside the cell to make water want to go in, which is what we just did there. Um, and then the last thing you need is for the pressure potential of the plant cell to be above the yield threshold. And that is just something you would have to be given. You couldn't calculate it in any way. So he would have to tell you like the pressure potential, whoops, is two and the yield threshold is let's say one, um, is the cell gonna elongate? Yes, because the pressure potential is greater than the yield threshold. So I was, I was telling some students earlier, I could see him asking a question like, what are uh, two reasons why a cell that needs to expand is not expanding? And the two big reasons I could see is like, number one is the water potential gradient not right? Is it actually like higher um, inside the cell and lower outside of the cell? So the gradient for water is pointed outward. And then another reason could be the pressure potential is actually below the yield threshold. So even if water is going in, it's not actually expanding it. Yeah, question. Oh, wait, sorry, what is yield threshold? Yield threshold is just um, a value that the pressure potential must reach in order to cause the cell to expand. So oh, if you okay. imagine like a balloon and you blow into it a little bit, and then if you blow enough, the whole rubber outside expands. Um, okay. so that point where it like starts to expand, that's kind of the yield threshold of the balloon. So you can technically get air into the balloon and not change the rubber. And then eventually you, re you reach some threshold and you actually expand the rubber. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So so it's like, so yield threshold, it's like a point where it would stop expanding, right? Um, no. It's just like a value the pressure has to reach in order to cause the cell to expand. So like with the balloon, like you blow in a little bit of air and you definitely get air into the balloon, but you maybe haven't stretched the rubber at all. And then at some point, boom, you stretch the rubber a ton. That threshold point, that amount of air that has gone in to cause it to expand, that's like the yield threshold of the balloon. I see. So the two ways to make cell expand is to have the pressure potential greater than the yield threshold and then like have the gradient so that water like moves in. Yeah. The and then cell. if the cell wall is super rigid and, and, and it hasn't broken up, like maybe the expansin proteins have a mutation, then again, you're you're not gonna get cell expansion even if you do have a ton of pressure and water going in. If the cell wall is intact, it's gonna work against that pressure and there will be no expansion. So I guess there's three, three different ways you could like not get expansion. If you stop the cell wall from breaking, if you make the gradient zero or in the wrong direction, and then if your yield threshold isn't reached. Um, yeah, so I put like, an example, yeah. 
Yeah, question. Oh, uh, just about what you were talking about before with the oxygen. So it, when you said it fills up like a balloon, that's with the hydrogen, right? No. Uh, when it fills up like a balloon, I'm talking about water going in. Oh, okay. So what is the hydrogen doing? Um, the hydrogen is being pumped into the cell wall. And that's first breaking up the cell wall. And then it's also causing a gradient where there's high hydrogen out and low hydrogen in. And that's used by a sim porter to get chloride in. And then also as you pump the hydrogen out, that's making the membrane potential super negative because you're causing all these positives to leave. And if the membrane potential becomes so negative that it's below the equilibrium potential for potassium, potassium is going to be driven in. So as long as there's channels for potassium, potassium will go in. Both of those um, ions going in, indirectly caused by the hydrogen pump, is going to affect the solute concentration, cause the solutes to go up, which decreases the solute potential, which decreases the water potential inside the cell, causing water uh, driving force to be pointed inward. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so this is an example of like a, a test question that has happened in the past. Not, not the exact question, but the equivalent. So it says like, which cell has the potential to elongate? Um, and it gives you the values of solute potential and pressure potential outside of the cell. And then the values of those inside of the cell. And it also tells you the yield threshold. Um, so water potential, you'll have to calculate for outside of the cell and inside of the cell. That will tell you the direction and magnitude of the driving force or gradient. And then the yield threshold, you just want to compare with the pressure potential and make sure it's reached. So like here, if I look at cell one, I know that the pressure inside the cell is above the yield threshold. So as far as that's going, that should allow it to elongate. Now I just need to make sure the water potential is pointed inward. If I look at this cell, the pressure potential is below the yield threshold. So I really don't even have to calculate the water potential because even if water wants to go into cell two, it's not going to elongate because it's not, its pressure potential is below the yield threshold. So this one, I can already say cell two is not going to elongate. Why? The yield threshold is not met. Cell one, I would have to calculate the water potential versus the outside. So the water potential outside is just going to be this value plus this value. So it should be negative two. Um, and then if I calculate this one, it's this value plus this value. So it's going to be negative four. So negative two versus negative four. Um, negative four is a lower value, a lower water potential. So um, the gradient is pointed into the cell, high to low, and cell one should, should elongate as long as the cell wall and expansions are um, working properly. So this is like a past exam question with this stuff. Um, this is also somewhere oops, I could see like the Nernst equation coming up. I could see him, you know, giving you concentrations of either hydrogen or potassium or chloride inside and outside of the cell. And then saying like, is potassium still going to want to move in? Or is hydrogen going to move out into the cell wall? 
Um, so he could change like the potassium concentrations to be um, maybe like ex way higher inside the cell than outside the cell, like even more than normal. And if you calculate the Nernst equation with that, maybe you get a new equilibrium potential that's like actually negative 200. And so now if the cell is at negative 130, normally that would drive potassium in, but under these new conditions, potassium's ECG is going to be pointed outward, right? Because if the cell's here, potassium wants it to be here, potassium wants the cell to be more negative, so potassium's going to be wanting to move out. And you actually would get less solutes inside the cell, possibly less um, water movement into the cell. So you could like have to calculate the Nernst equation, figure out the ion movements, and then given how this situation works, can you say, how's that gonna affect like solute potential, water potential, and then therefore water movement and cell expansion? Yeah, question? Can we go over an example with like using Nernst equation? I kind of want a refresher on that. Sure. Um, let's say um, maybe we can calculate the ECG of chloride molecules and say, does chloride need a channel um, to help with cell expansion or does it need um, active transport? Okay, so it's 30 inside the cell and um, one outside the cell or in the apoplast. So I think he would, yeah, he would definitely give you the Nernst equation because he has in the past. Um, so you would do 59 over negative one. Actually, he usually doesn't give you the Z part. You just have to know to add the Z. And then log outside, which is one over inside, which is 30. And then that would give you the equilibrium potential for chloride. Now let's all calculate it because I always make mistakes when I calculate. So, or if someone's like really confident and they just want to shout it out because they're like, I know the answer. Okay, I think I got 88, is that what you guys got? We did get that. Nice. Okay, so we know that equilibrium potential for chloride is oops, positive 88. And then he would have to tell you like what the um, membrane potential or the electrical gradient is. Let's say the membrane potential or electrical gradient is negative 30. when the hydrogen pumps are working correctly, um, then what is the um, 
direction that chloride wants to move. And so if chloride wants to be at positive 60, it wants the membrane to be way more positive than it is now. So chloride is a negative ion. So if it moves into the cell, it's going to make it more negative, which is not what it wants. But if chloride moves out of the cell, then it's going to make it more positive, and that's what it wants. So um, the ECG for chloride is going to be chloride to move um, out. Wait, how did you know, like, like it wants, it, like chloride wants, wants it to be like 60, you say? Um, it wants to be um, at 60? Positive 80. Oh, sorry, positive 88. Because that's the, what you calculated with the NERST equation. That's the equilibrium potential. Okay, so that's what it wants to be at, but inside the cell is negative 130. Yeah, which is the electrical gradient. But we want to make the inside of the cell 88, right? If is you're a chloride point? ion, yes, that's what you want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's how you're going to move. But um, on a test, don't say chloride wants to be at positive 80, you would say the driving force on chloride is outward because um, the electrical chemical gradient is outward. Um, so one other thing he could do is be like, okay, so under normal conditions, We've established that, or I, actually, before I say that, go back to my original question, which is, would chloride need a channel or a um, active transport protein like an ATPase or a symporter? And we can see that in order to get chloride in, it needs active transport, which is why we have this um, symporter here, which allows us to go to push chloride against its gradient because it uses the force of hydrogen going down its gradient. Um, so another question that you could see on top of that is like, okay, well, what would happen to chloride movement if we made the hydrogen pump less efficient? So if the hydrogen pump is less efficient, then we're gonna get less positive charges leaving. And you would expect this membrane potential to be less negative. Um, so what you end up doing is, let's say you moved the membrane potential from negative 30 to, I don't know, let's say negative 50. How is that going to affect um, chloride movement? Well. It's definitely going to affect like the magnitude of the ECG for chloride, right? Because the um, driving force is the difference um, between where chloride wants to be and what the actual membrane potential is, right? You'll remember that the driving force equation is membrane potential minus. equilibrium potential for the ion. Um, so by changing this to negative 50 minus 88 versus negative 130 minus 88, you made the magnitude of the driving force smaller to go out. But that doesn't really affect chloride movement because chloride's being moved against its gradient. Um, so that's not really gonna do anything. However, that would do something if like, let's say we calculated the equilibrium for potassium. And like I said, it was like negative 80. 
uh, by changing the membrane potential now to negative 50, um, what we've done is change the direction of the potassium um, ECG. When it was at negative 30, that was below, more negative than the equilibrium potential. Um, so potassium is going to want to move in to try to get the membrane potential here. But now when the membrane potential is higher than the equilibrium, now potassium wants the membrane potential to be more negative to get to here. And so it's actually gonna to wanna to move out to get it there. And if potassium is moving just from a channel, it's actually gonna move out and not contribute to increasing the solute concentration. So all of this is to say, you should be able to do like Nernst equation stuff and then reason what is the direction of the ion going to move? What's the direction of, you know, uh, hydrogen ions going to move? He could give you those concentrations. And then what would be the impact on solute concentration and expanding of the plant cell? All right. Uh, yeah. So this point way plants might direct certain areas to grow more than others. It, that's kind of how I said the uh, blue light that's detected by phototropin then causes the pin proteins to move to different sides of the plant cells. And depending on where they are, that directs auxin to concentrate in certain areas of the cell. So just literally by moving the pin proteins in response to light allows auxin to accumulate at different areas. And because auxin is stabilizing the hydrogen pump, auxin, wherever it accumulates, is going to be where uh, the plant grows more. And so I listed the whole signaling pathway there, but I'm, I'm very certain he wouldn't like have you memorize that or ask you about it. Um, cool. Um, now we can talk about transpiration. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I, I kind of just So now we can talk about, again, water movement, but now instead of just looking at an individual plant cell that's getting bigger or smaller, we're talking about water moving through uh, the entire plant. What I like to do is draw, I don't know, tree it has some roots from soil. And so basically we want water that's starting in the soil to travel into the roots, either from the apoplast route or the symplast route, get into the xylem, get into the tube, and because of cohesion, which is just water sticking to other water molecules, this water column is all attached and it goes all the way up to the leaf and then the leaf cell walls where, um, like I showed you guys, there's now like a little film of water and then to like the leaf airspace. And then eventually through the stomata and out. So how do we get that movement all the way from the soil out of the plant? Um, again, it's just a water flux problem. So the flux of water or the movement of water is going to be determined by the gradient or the driving force, which is the difference in the water potential of whatever two areas you're considering, uh, times the conductance, which in this case is open stomata. That's the main resistance. 
So yeah, I could see him asking about water as a flux equation in transpiration. And you definitely, whenever you're talking about water potentials, just add in the word gradient and driving force. Whenever you're talking about open and closing stomata and its impact on transpiration water flux, put the word, I mean, put the word um, resistance in there, increasing or decreasing resistance. Um, but generally, as long as the stomates are open and we have some non-zero resistance to flow, then we're gonna get water moving as long as we have low, um, I mean, high to low water potential. So the water potential of the soil should be the highest. And the water potential of the soil is determined by um, negative pressure. So that's pressure potential, but it's negative pressure in the soil uh, plus solute potential. And then so from a lot of decrease resistance. Mm. Yeah, for increased transpiration, yes. So decrease resistance by opening the stomata for increased transpiration. So we want this water potential to be the highest. And it needs to be higher than the water potential of the roots. And if it's the uh, root cells, that's determined by what all cells are determined by, which is solute potential and uh, pressure potential. And if it's the root apoplast, then it's just determined by negative pressure. Um, so problems you could get is like him changing the water potential of the soil somehow by maybe saying like there's an increase in the nutrients in the soil you have a high nutrient soil that would increase the solutes in the soil decreasing the solute potential decreasing the water potential overall what effect is that going to have for transpiration well, we really want the soil to be super high in water potential. We want it to be the high end of the gradient. So if we're decreasing it, we're actually gonna decrease water flux from the soil to the roots. Um, another thing he could change about the soil is the negative pressure. Although I feel like he emphasized this a little bit less than other professors, um, but this negative pressure is caused by if you just zoom in on the soil molecules, um, you get actually some of those little radius of menisci in between soil particles. And the idea is the smaller the radius, the higher the tension, the more negative the pressure. So if you have um, soil particles that are super close together, that's going to cause this menisci to be smaller, which means more tension, more negative pressure. If there's more negative pressure, this being more negative makes this more negative. And again, that would be pretty bad for transpiration because ideally we want the soil water potential to be higher than the roots. If you make that smaller, then it's less water movement from the soil to the roots. So increasing solutes or somehow making the um, radius of menisci in the soil smaller, those are two ways to decrease transpiration at the level of soil to roots. Um, other ways it could possibly, yeah. Um, so you split the roots into two, did you split the roots into symplastic and apoplastic or? Yeah. So the, um, would it be the symplastic would only be affected by pressure? The apoplastic. 
would only be affected by pressure yeah why because um if you were to kind of zoom in on like a water molecule in the apoplast it's connected all the way to molecules in the uh, xylem so if you uh, increase the negative pressure like from pulling water up through the xylem that will increase the negative pressure in the roots as well okay but why wouldn't it be affected by solutes um just because there's no way of like regulating the amount of solutes that go into the apoplast area. So we just typically see that solutes don't play a huge role in the water potential of the root apoplast. Okay, but the solutes play a big role in the symplast because um, the membranes are selectively permeable? Yes, yeah. Okay, got it, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, so those are things that could change transpiration at this level. And then I'm going to go ahead and just say like, um, changing anything with the water potential of the roots gets complicated. And at least historically, professors of 220 have, have not manipulated these just because it gets a little bit complicated. And I do know, like, in his lecture, he said, like, oh, we would have to give you these values for the root cells. So I also don't think he would test you on it either. Um, but then the next level is going to be the water potential of the xylem, which is just determined by negative pressure. And again, that's just more tension that's really happening because of pull from the top, more tension all through the xylem is more negative pressure, which is making this more and more negative, which is good for causing water to move up towards the xylem up this way, right? We want it to be high and then low here. So the lower we get here by causing more and more tension, the more we're pulling water up. Okay, and then from the xylem, you go to the um, leaf cell wall. Which is again, just negative pressure. Um, so that's when if you kind of imagine the leaf cells, they have like this film of water on them and this film of water is continuous with the xylem and it's in direct contact with the leaf airspace and water is just continuously evaporating into the leaf airspace and it's actually that evaporative movement of those water molecules leaving that pulls on the water in the leaf cell wall causing negative pressure and causes all the negative pressure below it here, here, and down here. So generally how you'll get any kind of question that manipulates these is something happening from the top. So if you, you know, close stomates or you um, change transpiration due to humidity stuff happening at the top, that will then affect the water potential here by making the negative pressure less negative. Because if there's less transpiration at the top, there's less pull, less pull, less tension, less negative pressure, you're gonna get less overall movement and decreased water potential of all of these. Yeah, question. Okay, so why would the xylem also not have, be affected by solute potential since um, that's what the everything is flowing into. So it has a selectively permeable membrane that allows for a different concentration of ions to come in. So why wouldn't that be a factor? Just again, because um, 
there is not channels and mechanisms for manipulating the amount of solutes in any significant amount to end up influencing water movement. Um, okay. So, yeah, and like for all of these levels, there's technically a ton of different variables that influence water potential, right? There's like um, gravity potential and matrix potential, but there's always a few or one that's kind of overall influencing it. So even if there's small changes in solute that are causing small changes in solute potential, it's never enough to be something worth acknowledging. That okay. Okay, and then from the leaf cell wall, you have the water potential of the leaf um, airspace. And this is the first area where it's no longer liquid water, it's gas water, water vapor. And therefore, now the only thing that matters is the relative humidity uh, potential. And there's really not many ways I can imagine, again, kind of like the roots, I can't see him really changing the relative humidity of the leaf airspace. It's always just pretty high of relative humidity just because there's always water. Uh, there's always a film of water here and there's always water evaporating into the leaf airspace. So relative humidity in the leaf airspace is relatively high, um, which is good because it makes sure that the direction of water movement is always from the leaf airspace. And then put my little card cells out into the atmosphere. So the last level would be the, the water potential of the atmosphere, which is also just determined by relative humidity. And so this is the one I could definitely see him manipulating in a question by saying, um, something that changes the relative humidity of the atmosphere and then how's that going to affect flux? And the idea would be like, let's say you increased temperature. Temperature has an inverse relationship with relative humidity. So increased temperature decreases relative humidity. And if you decrease relative humidity, you would decrease relative humidity potential and you would decrease the atmosphere potential. Um, by making the low part of the gradient, right? We want it to be high here, low here, more low, then you're going to increase flux and increase water movement and increase transpiration. And the opposite, if you decrease the temperature, you'll actually increase relative humidity, the atmosphere. If you increase relative humidity, you'll increase the water potential, and that would be actually bad because that would make the gradient smaller, would make the driving force smaller, and you'll get less flux. And so go, kind of going back to everything going on below, if you decrease flux at this portion, like from the leaf airspace to the atmosphere, then you're going to affect everything below it because it's that movement that's causing the pull, that's causing the negative pressure. Um, so if you de decrease transpiration at the top, you're gonna decrease tension and decrease really water movement all the way up the xylem. Um, yeah, so then one thing I, last one I mentioned that I didn't really talk enough about is the radius of menisci in terms of the leaf cell wall. So again, if you zoomed in like on the cell wall of these leaves, it might look something like this. Then you have this film of water that's forming these radius of menisci. And the more evaporation that you have into the leaf airspace, the smaller those radius of menisci get smaller means more tension and more negative pressure. And so the more and more negative this becomes because the radius of menisci is getting smaller, the more you're driving water from the xylem to move in that direction.
So yeah, I definitely would prepare for something changing the atmospheric relative humidity and then explaining how that works. And then again, throughout all of this, you want to be using the words gradient, driving force, resistance for how and why water is moving. I think he did like an example where he like added fake resistance in the xylem by adding membranes in there. So he's gonna change the either the gradient or the resistance somewhere in here. And you're gonna have to talk about the flux and use all the right words. <laughs> Okay, um, and then he also said no, this as a mass balance problem. So mass balance is when you draw like a theoretical cup and you have a rate in and a rate out. So in this case, we're considering water into a plant. You label your cup plant and the inside of your cup is water. Um, and then the rate in is going to be um, root uptake. Of water. And then the rate out is going to be transpiration And so he could give you some kind of scenario and ask you like, if you change something in this diagram, how's that gonna change the amount of water in the plant? So like, for example, in the night, stomata become closed. Use mass balance to explain what will happen to the amount of water in the plant. So if you close stomata, what you're going to do is cause um, a decrease in the transpiration, right? So we're gonna make that arrow smaller or non-existent if there's no stomata open. Um, but root uptake shouldn't change. So if you decrease the rate out, but don't change the rate in, you should have an increase in the total water inside the plant. So that's kind of how you would use mass balance reasoning. Can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. So earlier you were saying that closing the stomata doesn't really necessarily mean that transpiration is done or like decreases. Is this like a different scenario or is this just like a different way of thinking about it? Like trans transpiration decreases a little bit but doesn't stop? I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I think the confusion is I said, if you decrease, if you close stomata, photosynthesis wouldn't be affected, but it definitely would affect transpiration. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, and the last topic is just nutrients. He put Casparian strip, which we already talked about. Um, and then also kind of the whole movement of ions um, that we kind of already talked about with the cell elongation. It's the same idea with root cells getting solutes into the root cells from the soil. Right, it kind of uses the exact same mechanism. So, um, like, if we were to look at an individual root cell, we have like different um, cations and anions outside of the cell. And it just uses that same mechanism where it will pump out hydrogen ions. And that's going to cause the membrane potential to be super low, which, which is gonna get like potassium ions in. 
and it's also going to create a hydrogen gradient, which then can be used with a um, SIMP order to get fluoride in. And then it's just kind of variations on that same theme for all different types of nutrients. And I could definitely see him giving you a new nutrient that's not potassium or chloride. And you'd have to kind of calculate the Nernst equation, figure out how it's gonna move, figure out what kind of transporter it needs, whether it's active or, or um, passive transport. Um, and the only other little random fact he included was like how uh, soil particles tend to be negatively charged and that attracts like the cations. And so an added benefit of getting hydrogen pumped out, besides creating a gradient, besides making the membrane potential super negative, is that um, it actually goes and replaces the, the seat of these cations that are being attracted to the soil particles. So like hydrogen can come over and take the place of potassium. So now potassium is free to like move and maybe go into the cell. It's not like bound to the soil anymore. So that's called cation exchange when like the hydrogen changes places with the potassium. Uh, yeah, question. Oh, um, for if the H plus pump suddenly stops, would the cell pressure just stay the same? What would happen to the cell pressure? So if the hydrogen pump stopped, yeah, that would cause the membrane potential to be less negative. So if everything's working properly, it's maybe making, and I just kind of made this number up, but it's maybe making it 100 and negative 35 millivolts. But if you stop this, then I would expect this to become less negative. And then depending on what you calculate the ECG or whatever molecules he gives you, that could impact how they move. So is there a concrete answer to how it would affect pressure? Because he had a question in the slides for testing your understanding. And it asks uh, if it stops, would the cell lose pressure? Okay, so yeah, let's look at right on this. So if you stop the pumps, then you're going to ruin the mechanism for getting chloride in. And if you make this too positive, you're probably going to ruin the mechanism for getting this in. So you ruined the two mechanisms of making the solute concentration. Oops. Um, to increase. So if you don't have the solute concentration increasing, what does that mean? That means your solute potential is more positive. If your solute potential is more positive than your water potential inside the cell is more positive. Water likes to move from high to low water potential. If you don't make this low, if the water potential becomes too high inside, water is not going to want to move in. Water moving in is what causes turgor pressure. So if you have less water moving in, then the pressure is going to go down. So pressure would go down, but what's leaving the cell? It would be water's leaving, or I don't know if water would be leaving or just less water going in, possibly leaving. Okay, so what's what's causing the pressure to decrease? If nothing's leaving the cell, wouldn't it? Wouldn't the pressure just stay constant? Or I'm a little confused with that. Well, it's just like, if water's going in at a certain rate to cause the pressure, if you decrease that rate or stop it completely, and the pressure is going to go down, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So water's water's not going in because 
because the hydrogen pump stops? Yes, because the hydrogen pump is causing the solutes in the cell to go up. And if you oh, don't do that, okay. then water doesn't want to move in either. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm. Yeah, so like again, where's my, oh, there. In the past, I don't know if it's relevant, but like past exams, the question was now asking about like magnesium or iron, or have you been seeing like nitrate as other nutrients where we haven't talked about them, but we're gonna give you the concentrations and based on what you know about potassium and chloride, can you say like what's going to happen with these new ions that you've never seen before? So I could see that maybe being a problem. Um, and then the last thing he talked about was just um, high CO2 atmospheres. And I'm not sure if that's what he was talking about with soil is complicated. Um, but the basic idea there was there was a study where in a high CO2 environment, the stomatas were closed more. Um, we're not exactly sure how or why, but the hypothesis is that the plant has enough CO2 around, so it's able to close its stomata because it doesn't need any more CO2 and hopefully save water that way. Um, and then the impact of that is you get less transpiration that also causes less root water uptake and less nutrient uptake and then lower protein content in the plant. Why? Because proteins are made of nutrients. Like you, the plant needs to take in nitrate because nitrogen is an important part of proteins. Um, and then as a side effect, by closing the stomata, you've got more oxygen inside the plant, which caused increased photorespiration. And you could even argue like, if you don't have enough nutrients to make proteins, proteins are really important for photosynthesis in general. And that could also be a reason why photosynthesis would decrease. But yeah, that just, that was that study that he talked about at the end. And that's all, that's all of the topics that he listed. That's all I have for you guys. Any other questions or things you'd like me to go over? Oh, Rachel? Yeah. Hi, uh, you just asked that question about the H plus pump closing, like how it would lose pressure, the reasoning. So if I'm just to confirm it. Yeah. From my understanding, so nothing can leave, but wait, so, okay. Because the H plus stops working, it doesn't drive anything else into it because none of the H plus is leaving. So there's yeah. no gradient, right? Yeah. But how does how does Cl minus and K plus leave? It's like, can K plus leave through the channel too? It can go in and leave through the same channel, right? So naturally, chloride wants to leave based on its electrochemical gradient. Um, and then potassium wants to go in, but only if the membrane potential is super negative. And the only reason why it's super negative is because of all these positive ions leaving. So if you mess right. up the pump, you'll probably make this shoot up above potassium's equilibrium to maybe like, I don't know, negative 60. So now potassium wants to leave. Gotcha. Okay, so potassium just leaves through the channel or through the membrane or whatever. Yeah. Through the yeah. channel, right? Yes. And CL can leave through the, it can't leave through the SIM porter, but it just leaves through channel or? It could actually flip its. It leave, yeah. Oh, okay. Porter. But then a hydrogen would be leaving too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I know what you do. Yeah, question. Um, so I'm still slightly confused about the, the hydrogen pump. If it stopped working and the pressure thing, wouldn't it equilibrate with the um, water potential outside of the cell so it would lose pressure? Yeah, it would definitely lose pressure. But you were saying that water doesn't exit the cell when the H plus pump stopped working, which I didn't understand because wouldn't it have to in order for pressure to decrease? Um, no. So in order for pressure to decrease, there's three things that I can see. So if water is actively going in at a certain rate to cause the pressure, if you just decrease that, but it's still going in, the pressure is going to be lower, right? And then if you stop the movement, so there's equal movements of water in and out, that's going to be way lower in pressure than like a really high amount of water going in. So you don't necessarily need to make water go out to decrease the pressure. And if you did cause water to go out, you wouldn't just decrease the pressure, you would kill the whole cell. Okay, um, I'm still not really getting it, but maybe that's that's just me. So if you imagine like us blasting a cell with water, versus just kind of slowly trickling in a little bit of water. Don't you think the one being blasted with water would have higher pressure? Yes. So that's all I'm saying is the pressure would decrease as long as the rate of water flux in the cell goes down. It doesn't oh. have to go out. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? All right, um, then I will end the Zoom and I will upload this, but hopefully if you were here the whole time, you won't watch it again because this is a long Zoom, but yeah. I will see you guys tomorrow and good luck on the exam. I hope you do well. I wish I could prepare you more. I wish I could have narrowed down the topics more, but alas. Thank you. Of course.